For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The following lesson is presented at 1008 East Exchange Parkway, Allen, Texas, by Merle Helwig on Sunday, January 3rd, 2021. We hope you enjoy What Does It Take to Make Life Successful? Glad to be here this morning. Glad to see everyone that's gathered. We've got a beautiful day. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you all know we started a new year, you know, and uh, we all hope uh, that the new year is probably going to be better than the last, but whatever happens is going to be the Lord's, uh, the Lord's will. <coughs> this morning, <coughs> excuse me, you know, I'd like to ask the question, what is it that makes life successful? In other words, what does it take to be successful in life? And you know, Alexander the Great, in, uh, in a very short period of time in his life, he had been what people had said, he was the conqueror of the world. He conquered the, the world in, in a short period of time. And many people would say, well, that was great. You know, he was successful. He was a successful, successful man. You know, power, prestige, and wealth, and, and, uh, and such as that is things I think that sometimes people have measured. Uh, to say whether one is successful or not, and uh, how much you gather in life or how much you possess in life is something that a lot of people will say, well, then they must surely be uh, successful in that. Whenever, Ale whenever Alexander the Great had conquered the world, you know, there was uh, little, I guess, that occupied his mind after, after that, and there were little things that would uh, still, I guess, left to be conquered, but little was uh, were they. And so because of that, the, they uh, said in the biography that I was reading about him was that he turned to, to alcohol and he started drinking. And, uh, and instead of keeping his eyes focused on something else or his thoughts on something else, he thought only about himself and... and uh, as one commentator, as uh, one in this biography that I read, said that he actually drank himself to death. Uh, others have said that was not the reason why his death. It was a contributing factor of that. But Alexander the Great died at 32 years of age. You know, he was not a, an old man at that period of time. Did a lot of things, accomplished a lot. And a lot of people would say he was the conqueror of the world and was a great individual for what he had done. But you know, I read over in Matthew, the 16th chapter in the 26th verse, where he says, what profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So whenever I'm thinking about that, when we think about success and what it is to be successful, and we look at Alexander the Great, I would say that he didn't quite measure up to what the Bible speaks about in this instance here in Matthew, the 16th chapter there. You know, the question of being successful in life is, uh, is something that's important. And, you know, the question comes is, is if one is successful and on his way to success, does God have a part in that or is God left out of those plans? And, you know, sad as it might say that many times God is left out of the plans whenever we think about being successful. Whenever we think about life and we think about what we can gain in life and the ladder of climbing the success ladder of life, sometimes God is not really a part of that, uh, of that plan. And usually whenever things are good, whenever life is good, whenever there's uh, little problems that one is facing, it seems like that's the time when God is uh, forgotten instead of the time that God should be present in one's, uh, in one's thoughts and actions and in one's life. The children of Israel, for example, whenever they left uh, Israel or left the land of Canaan, they were a distressed people. And uh, as it was, there was a famine in the land and and, uh, and many of them were probably at the point, what you would say, starvation. And so Joseph invited 
his father who invited the entire family down to Egypt to live because there was no famine in Egypt there and they had made the preparations and prepared for it and they had stocked their granaries full and such as that. And so when Israel's family moved down to, uh, to Egypt, I'm sure at that point they would prayed many times that God would send them food, that God would help them out of this distressful situation. Whenever they arrived in Egypt, they probably thought they had arrived at the promised land, a land that was flowing truly with milk and honey for them because they had the food they wanted, they had the things they needed for their animals to survive with, they had the food that they wanted to eat and such as that. And you know, they were happy and they probably, as I say, they probably thought of Egypt as what the Bible describes Canaan as the land of milk and honey that flows, the land that flows with milk and honey. But you know, it wasn't until they found themselves slaves in Egypt, there was another Pharaoh that came up and saw the Israelites as a threat. And then the happiness that they'd had before was gone. And probably during that period of time of the good times, the good years, God was not the most prevalent thing in their mind. But as they found themselves in slavery, they began to pray. They prayed to God. They asked God for deliverance. And God did deliver them. And we know the story of how God delivered them. He sent the plagues upon Egypt. And, and finally, at the death of the firstborn son, they were free. And, you know, they were happy at that. And I'm sure they rejoiced at that. And as they... Headed, as they headed towards the promised land, the land that they had heard about, the land that flowed with milk and honey, they came to the Red Sea, and it was then that Pharaoh and his people had repented of the matter of letting them go and sent his army after them. And, and once again, whenever they saw themselves in distress, they cried out and they thought that God had brought them out into the wilderness there just for them to die. But you know what? It was... Then that God told Abraham, or God, Abraham, or Moses, I'm sorry. Moses told the people there, he said, stand still. Stand still. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13, he said, do not be afraid. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Then he goes on, he says, which he will with the, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. You know, if uh, you were Israel at that time, if you were seeing an army that was coming behind you that probably had nothing in their mind but slaughtering the, Egypt, the Israelites, you were an Israelite and you felt you were defenseless, what would you want to do? Well, remember the Forrest Gump movie? Whenever he said, run, Forrest, run, that would have been the idea for me at that point. You know, I would have been ready to, to run, ready to get out of there. But you know what God told Israel and what Moses told Israel was this, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And you know, there's something else about this. If you were Israel... And God told you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What do you think God would do? What do you think how he would do? Do you think he would just destroy that army? Well, probably that would be the first thing on our mind, that he would destroy the army. But do you think in a, in a million years that Israel thought that God was going to part the Red Sea make a pathway through the Red Sea for them to escape, and then close that sea, have that water come down on the Egyptians and the army there and destroy that army? You know, I don't think in a million years I would have ever, ever thought of that. You know, a little boy came home from church one day and his mother didn't take him to church, sent him to church, and... Whenever he got home, his mother asked the question, well, what did, you, what did you learn today? He said, well, I learned how that God took the Israelites to the Red Sea. Moses built a pontoon bridge that went over the Red Sea. Israel crossed over that pontoon bridge to the other side. 
And therefore they were saved, and whenever they got to the other side, they closed the bridge. You know, they took the bridge, they took the, pulled the bridge down, and Israel could was saved because the Egyptians couldn't get across. His mother looked at him and he says, Now are you sure that's what they said? And he said, If I told you what the what that teacher told or what that preacher told that day, you wouldn't believe it either. How many would believe that God could open the Red Sea? How many believe that God could destroy Pharaoh's army? There's probably not another person on the face of the earth would have even thought about that. But God did. And God protected Israel. And Israel rejoiced on the other side. And you know, I think sometimes, brethren, one of the things that we do is, is we need to stand still and look what God can do and receive and be willing to accept what God can do. You know, there's something else I think that we need to recognize also is this, is that, you know, I don't believe that people have a problem with God necessarily, of believing that there is a God of heaven. You know, just looking around at, at this world that we live in and the things that God has created, it's hard for me, and I think it's hard for a lot of people to recognize that this just didn't happen. You know, it didn't happen by a big bang. It wasn't by a big explosion in the world. It just happened. We can see that there's a divine creator behind it all. You know, I don't believe that people necessarily, a lot of people have trouble accepting the idea of God. But I do believe people have the problem of accepting how powerful and the magnitude of God, how wonderful God is. You know, Israel, and going on further into, into their life, getting up into the book of Isaiah there, they were having a difficult time. They were having problems, and they were having some difficult times at that, at that point. And God wanted to encourage them, because you know what they were thinking was, was this, that God does not care about me. God doesn't care about us. We are His people, but He really doesn't care about us. So Isaiah was writing to the people there of Israel, trying to reestablish their faith. And you know, here's the thing with our language. You know, I realize that our language is pretty good, and I think we can say a lot of things, and probably we can say things that uh, maybe we shouldn't say. I'll put it that way. But you know, there's something about our language. How can we use our language to describe who God is? The power of God. And you know how limitless God is. I don't believe there's words within our language to really express that. But Isaiah, he tries. He tries to show the people who God is. And the power who God, who, uh, that God has. In Isaiah, the 40th chapter, you know, he speaks about here, he speaks about the waters that's on this earth, that's in the oceans, that's in our lakes, that are in our rivers. And you know what? God has measured every bit of that. God knows how much water is on this earth. He's measured it. He knows how many, how many gallons, I guess you would say, of water is in the ocean. He knows how many gallons of water is in the Mississippi River and all the other rivers on this earth. You know, that is beyond my comprehension. You know, I don't even know how many gallons is in the baptistry here. I don't know how many gallons is in the reservoir that, supply, that supplies water to this area. I have no idea. But you know what? God, God knows. He said there that He's measured it in the hollow of His hand. He knows the expanse of heaven. And you know, He said that He's measured heaven with a span. And what is a span? You know, a span, according to the dictionary, the definition is, is the distance between this little finger and the tip of the tongue, uh, the tip of the thumb, tip of the tongue, the tip of the thumb, the, the, 
the thing. <laughs> I better quit on that one anyway. But anyway, you get the idea. From here to here is a span. And you know what? He said, that is God's hand. He measured heaven with that. Now, you know, back on the farm, we had horses, and you measured the height of a horse by hand. And a horse, a good riding horse, was usually about 14 hands high. And how you measured a 14 hands high, you measured it this way. That right there is a hand, you know. And that was to the withers on a horse. But God measured the entire heaven with the span of his hand. And he didn't say spans, it says span. Can you imagine how big God's hand is? How many miles heaven is? How many square miles heaven is? Kilometers, however you want to measure it. I don't believe I can quite get that into my little head anyway to figure out how much it is or to even comprehend that. You know, there's something else he also does. He knows and he weighs, he knows how much dust is on this earth. <laughs> how many of us have worried about the dust? How many of us is worried about how much dust is on this earth? You know, there were the years where it was referred to as the dust bowl, you know, in that area there. And I was raised in Kansas and I saw pictures of it. I mean, this was before my time where dust had actually covered the fences. You know, you could see the fit, top of the fence post. And it was drifted up on those fences just like snow would be. You know, how many times has the mother of the house said, you know, I've got to do the dusting today. Do you realize that God knows how much dust is in your house? Do you realize that God knows how much dust is on your car or in your car? Do you realize that God knows how much dust is in this world? Now that is something I can't even begin to imagine. You know, I was in Mexico, right out in San Mexico one time, and there was a dust storm came up. and Never seen one of those before. Never been in one of those before. But there was this big wall, I mean a big brown wall coming at us. And all it was was dust. And whenever you were in that dust storm, you couldn't see but a few feet probably in front of you. And you know, think about that. God knew how much dust was in that storm. When we were in Honduras, there was a little village there called Korai. We had a work going there. And, and there's some stories we could tell you about Korai. The road into that place was horrible. You know, sometimes you couldn't in that in that uh, four wheel drive Toyota Land Cruiser we had. We couldn't drive fast enough to keep ahead of our own dust. It wasn't a dust storm; it was a dust that was trailing behind us there, and we couldn't keep ahead of it there. You know, I hated that drive in there, but Trina can tell you though we had a friend on that road though. There was a big, there was a big lizard about so big that had lost his tail. And he was always on this curve waiting for us to come around that curve. And Trina and Todd, they named that lizard Stubby because he lost his tail. You know, it was in that place, Korai, that I think I ate buzzard one time. We had buzzard for lunch that day. I'm, I'm convinced it was buzzard. I'd never eaten anything that tasted like that before in my life. And it, that meat was looked like chicken, but it was as black as it could be. It had to be buzzard, I think. But you know what? That was a dusty place. And God knew how much dust was there. I just can't comprehend that myself. Listen to this verse here. Verse 12 of Isaiah 40. He said, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains. He knows how much the mountains weigh. 
you ever thought about it? Have you looked at the Rocky Mountains or Pikes Peak and said, I wonder how much this thing weighs? God knows how much it weighs. He said there he's weighed the mountains and the hills in a balance. You know, before Christopher Columbus ever sailed the ocean blue, so to speak, Isaiah knew the world was round. Because there in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22 there, the first part of that, he said, And he who sits on the circle of the earth, above the circle of the earth. You know, this is God that has done these things. It's God that has the power. Have you ever looked up in the night sky whenever you're away from the city lights and see all the beautiful stars up there and have tried to count them? How can you count the stars? You know, even if you could count the stars you see, what they tell me is that if you have a telescope, you can even see more stars beyond what we can see with the natural naked eye. And you know what? They say if you've got a more powerful telescope than that, you can see even beyond that, and there's still more stars out there. Well, have you ever gotten a little puppy a brand new little puppy, and I wonder now, what are you going to name it? How long does it take for you to name a dog? How long does it take for you to name a little puppy? Sometimes it takes quite a while. Johnny Elmore, you know, his parents couldn't think of a name for him, and so they just called him Little Boy or Sonny or something like that. I don't know what it was till he was about nine years old. And finally he came in one day and he said, I think I like the word, I like the name Johnny. And so they named him Johnny. It took a while to get that name, didn't it? How long do you think it took your parents to name you? Well, you know what? Names are not always easy to come by, but did you know that God has a name for every star? He has named every star that's there that you can see and the ones that you even can't see. And he makes sure that everyone is in its place. You know, that is hard for me to even comprehend. You know, there in Isaiah, the 40th chapter and the 26th verse, he said, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out the host by number." He calls them by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. He's talking about the stars. You know, when I consider God, all that he's done, all the power that he has, how can we not think of that Religious song that is one of the most popular, not the most popular religious songs, but the next one to it. Amazing Grace is that most popular one. How Great Thou Art is second. Have you ever heard George Beverly Shea sing that song? You know, if you have, you probably never forgot it. The words go like this, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. How great thou art. It's a wonderful song. It's a song that we've sung for years and years. Written back in 1885. And it is still popular even to this very day. You know, life is filled with its challenges. And I'll be, asked, I'll be first to say that life is stressful. This last year that we've gone through has been a stressful year. And you know, I hope that the next year, this, this year that we're in now, that we're starting, will be a, a better year, but I don't really know that it will be. You know, whenever the coming year and such as that and the stress of life, and it all comes down to this is, how much can we really do? How much is in our power that we can do? And how much can we really affect in our lives? 
You know, sometimes I look down, I think it is that God looks down on us, sees everything, it's in His control, it's according to His plan. We have trouble understanding what His plan is, and even though that we wonder sometimes, I think we might even question, does God really know how much suffering I'm doing? You know, Israel, I think, had that in their mind. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 27 and 28, he said, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. You know, one of the things that what Isaiah wanted the people to know is that even though they may say that God is disconnected with us, God doesn't see, God doesn't know. What he wants them to know is that God is an everlasting God. His understanding is unsearchable. And I believe he knows the very details of our heart. You know, if God knows... How much dust is in this world? That's just, you know, beyond my comprehension there. If he knows how much dust is in your car, if he knows how much dust is in a dust storm, do you think he doesn't know who you are? His creation, the one that created you, that gave you the breath of life, do you think he doesn't understand the details of your life, the problems that you face in life, the joys that you have, the problems that are you encounter day by day. No, I believe that God knows. You know, whether we believe in our heart or whether the world believes in our heart, there is no God. That doesn't affect God. He's still there. The power that you might relegate to God or believe that God has or doesn't have doesn't affect the power that God has. You know, we all get tired, I believe, in life. The older we get, I think the tireder we get. The slower we get. We look back at those earlier years of our lives and we think, youth, what it would be to be have that same energy to have that strange, same strength that as I had when I was younger. But you know what? The Bible tells us that even, even the youth, even the ones with that abounding strength and exuberant life that they have, is going to fail also. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 30, it said, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the youth and the young man shall utterly fall. You know, what that tells me is this, is as we age, we're going to get weaker, we're going to slow down, we're not going to have the strength, the energy that we used to have. But what it also tells me is even the youth, you cannot depend on that strength either. In other words, as we stand before God, there is nothing in our being there that makes us powerful enough to stand alone and to be alone. We need help. Israel learned what it was like to need help as they stood in bondage there. When they came to the Red Sea, they saw what they couldn't do, but they saw what God could do. And I think that we need to recognize that there are things that we cannot do and I believe we must accept that. You know, in life, one of the things that I recognize is this. And I think we must come to grips with it that there are things that we cannot control. Now, I know that we like to control things. I know we like to control the surroundings. You know, we like to control the people that are around us and that. But you know what? You cannot control such some things. You cannot control the, the thoughts of another person. You cannot control the way they are going to respond or such as that. 
We can't control the wind. We can't control that hot wind that blows in July and August. We can't control the cold wind that blows in January and February. It's out of our power. But you know what? When things are beyond our control, when things are beyond our power, beyond our strength, what would be the advice that God might give? God told Israel whenever they were helpless before the Egyptians was stand still. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God took care of it. That may be a lesson for us today. Stand still and let God do His part. Let God do His part and let us be do our part. What is our part? Well, it is to be faithful. Be faithful to God. Trust in Him. You know, have you ever heard or ever seen the, uh, the movie Hachi, A Dog's Tale? That's one of the saddest, saddest movies I think I've ever seen. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't cry through that one, you probably, well, I might say, where is your heart on that deal? You know, Hachi's a little dog, you know, and I don't know whether I'm pronouncing the name in the English they give it Hachi, but in in uh, in Japan is where this dog was from. His name was Hachiko, and I'm not saying that I'm pronouncing that right in Japanese, but that was the dog's real name. He was abandoned, the dog, and he was finally adopted by a man, and, and he loved his new master. His new master would every day would take the train to work. Every day at 5 o'clock he would come home on that 5 o'clock train, and there would be Hachi waiting for him waiting at the train station. Every day that went on. And finally what happened was, was this master, one day while he was at work, had a heart attack and died. Hachi was there at the train waiting for him that day. But he didn't come. Every day after that, Hachi was at that train station at 5 o'clock waiting for his master to come home. And it wasn't just for a week. It wasn't just for a month. It was for over nine years that dog every day went to that train station and was there at five o'clock waiting for his master to come, but his master never came. Hachi finally died. He died on March the 8th, 1935. He was what I would say a faithful dog. He knew what it was like and he wasn't being rewarded in any of that time. He just knew who his master was. He just knew who his master was and that his master was absent. But he was going to be there. And you know, faithfulness is one of the things that doesn't necessarily go unnoticed. You might say that nobody notices when someone is faithful. Well, they do. The people, they built a statue, a monument there of Hachi. Placed it right there at the train station. And you know, it was there that during World War II that that monument or that statue of this dog was destroyed in the, in the war, World War II. Right after... World War II, shortly after that, I believe it was in 1948, they built another statue. The trains that carried his master to work, it was renamed and now it's called the Hachi Line, the Hachiko Line. He was faithful. You know, what does that mean? It's a sad, sad story. But you know, that dog understood what it was to be faithful to his master. And you know, one of the things, brethren, that what we need to do is learn what it is to be faithful to God also. You know, the rebellious spirit is not for us. It is to conform to God's way and be willing to do that. 
willing to conform to His way. You know, there's things that I say that you can't control in life. And you know, I told this story before, but it's a good one, I think. And the little boy before car seats and such as that was standing up in the car seat there with his dad. His dad told him to sit down. To sit down and buckle up, buckle his seat belt up, and the little boy wouldn't do it. Finally, the dad made him sit down, physically made him sit down, buckle his seat belt. The little boy looked up at his dad and he said, but inside I'm still standing. You may make me sit down, but inside I'm still standing. You know, we smile at that determination of that young one there. But the sad part of life is, is that many people are doing that. Maybe they're outwardly conforming because they feel like they have to. But inwardly, they're still standing. Brethren, we need to surrender our lives to the Lord. We need to surrender our lives to the Lord. Let Him take charge. Let Him take control. There's only so much that we can do in life. And what we can do, we should do and affect that. You know, I read a story one time about a man, and it was when I was preparing to preach the funeral of a good friend of mine that died a number of years ago. But this man was a, was a humble man. He lived years and years and years and years back. He didn't have a lot of wealth. He worked for a, his landlord and had a little portion at a little cabin there that he lived in. The landowner was a wealthy man. He owned property. He owned a lot of property. And you know, he was out one day riding his horse, surveying the property that he had and all of that, and he came past this old man's house. And he saw the old man sitting down to his supper there. And what he had was a little bit of cheese and a little bit of bread. And he bowed his head and was giving thanks for that little bit that he had to eat. The rich man on his horse went on and he shook his head and thought, you know, how could you give thanks for that? He was used to a table that was spread with all that he wanted, all the food that he wanted, the best of the food. And as he rode on, there was another fellow that stopped him on the road there and he spoke to him and he said, you know, tonight the richest man in this valley is going to die. Well, the old the fellow went on, but as he went on, he was thinking about it. He was thinking about who he was because he knew he was the richest man in that valley. He knew he had all of the property. He knew he had all of the money, basically. So whenever he got home, he, you know, he took stock of himself. You know, how am I feeling? He got to thinking, you know, I feel pretty good. But then he got thinking, well, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not feeling as good as I should be feeling. So he calls his doctor. He called the doctor, and that was when they made house calls then. The doctor came to his house. The doctor examined him, and he said, No, I said, you're healthy. There's nothing wrong with you. The man felt better then. He went in, went to bed that night, slept, not necessarily slept peacefully, but he slept. Got up the next morning and felt like it. He said, Well, you know, I'm still alive. I see the sun of another day. And it was then, came the knock on his door, and the man said, the old man that you saw last night that was given thanks for that little bit of bread and little bit of cheese died last night. You know, as the man said, the richest man in that valley died. Success and wealth is not measured by how much you possess. It doesn't matter how much gold, how much silver you have, how, many, how much property you have, how big your house is, how wonderful your car is, or any of that. Success is going to be measured by what you are to God. 
and what your obedience is, how you serve God, and whether you've been faithful to Him throughout life. Listen to these two verses here. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 29 and verse 31. He said He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might He increases strength. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What he's saying is in these verses there is that God is taking care of us there. He gives power to the weak. And I believe that we all can feel that weakness of the human, the human life. The human body is weak. He gives strength to that. He increases our strength. Those that have no strength. Have you ever been to the point where you feel like you just cannot go on? There is too much. But God shows you the way. But listen to what He said. You know, He said to Israel, He said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now He's telling Israel, now He says, Those who wait... Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles to soar above it all. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, waiting on the Lord is allowing Him to guide, allowing Him to lead, allowing Him to take control. When Israel stood still, it was a time that I would say, it's time to run. But God said, stand still. Whenever we're at the crossroads of life and the problems of life, not knowing what to do, that is when we wait on God. God has the power. He has the ability to take care of the things that need to be cared for. We need to depend on God. We need to allow God to be God. We need to stand still and see the salvation of God. And you know what? In doing that, there's one thing that you don't have to worry about. There's one thing that you don't have to worry about, and that is the future. When we stand with God, we don't worry about the future. Because listen to this verse. A little verse over in the book of Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter and the 12th verse. He said, Though the sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it will be well with them, and well with those that fear God, and that fear before Him. You ever looked at the wealth of the world and such as that, and seemed like they have not a care? But you know what he said? Though they live, their days be prolonged and such as that, it will be well with those that fear God. You know, in Romans, the 8th chapter, the Apostle Paul brings it home to us now. Verses 31 through 33. Romans chapter 8, he says, What shall we say then? What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for all of us, for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. In other words, brethren, it's this way. God determines who's successful and who's not. Who has made the, 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 made the cut, I guess you would say. Made it to the end. God has set the standard for us. And God is going to help us along the way. You know, he says there, who would dare? Who would dare to bring a charge against God's elect? Think about that. You know, the world is pretty casual about it all, isn't it? The world looks around as there's nothing happening. There's nothing important in this world. And God is not it. Everything else is more important. 
But you know, it comes down to this. It is God who justifies. It is not man that sets the standards. I don't set the standards. You don't set the standards. It's God. And you know what? The one that walks in God's way has no fear of the future. Matthew 26 and verse, or Matthew 16 and verse 26. He says, and I read this before, he says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, if you stood before God at judgment, you stood before God and you were unprepared, you were not ready to meet God, not ready to meet judgment. What would you give? What could you give to prepare yourself to make God say or cause God to say, welcome. Enter into the joy that has been prepared from the foundation of this world. What is it that you could give? Well, there's nothing in this world you can give. There's no wealth. There's nothing in this world. The only thing is you. Is surrendering your life, surrendering yourself to God and His way. When we're willing to surrender our lives to God, surrender our lives to Him, you know, we're not still standing inside. We're submitting to Him. We're walking in His way. We're doing His thing, not our thing. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you know, I don't know of a better and more important decision that can be made than to obey the Gospel of Christ. You know, God gave His Son wasn't from this earth, but lived in heaven with Him. To come down to this earth. And there in this life, He died on the cross for you and I. So that we might have life. That we might have life everlasting. But you know what? The only way that can be done is by us surrendering to Him. And that is by following the commands of the Scripture. We have to believe we have to believe in Jesus. We have to repent of our sins or be willing to change this life that we're living to follow Him. We must confess His name before men or confess our faith. Whenever the Ethiopian man, whenever he saw the water, he said, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? And it was Philip that said, if you believe, you may. And what was it he said there? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. On that confession, the chariot was stopped. They got down. They both went down into the water and, and Philip baptized him. And he went on his way. The man went on his way home rejoicing. There was a man that was baptized down in San Antonio. He was an older gentleman. I think I've told him before, he had one leg had been amputated because he was in, in Vietnam and that Agent Orange, I guess, did a matter on him and had his leg removed. And I was studying there in this, with, this, with this group and he said, you know, he said, I just feel like I'm lost and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm lost. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm going straight to hell is what he said. Well, you know what I said? I can help you with that matter. You know, you may not have financial advice that I can give because I don't know much about that. There's a whole lot of things I don't know about, but I do know what it takes to be saved. And you know what I did? I, I went down and I went through the plan of salvation. We read a Scripture for every step on that. We got down to the end. He says, when can you do it? When can I be baptized? You know, you talk about joy to hear those words. When can I be baptized? 
You know, I said, all it takes is to fill the baptistry. We can do it. We called one of the brethren. I asked one of the brethren to help me because he had, because he was had one leg. Getting into the baptistry and getting out of the baptistry was going to be difficult. He was like 70 plus years of age. I think he was about 76, I believe, at that time. And we got him down in there and he, we baptized. He came up out of that water and, and you know, he was trying to get his feet back under him or get his foot back under him there. And we got a hold of him and lifted him up and, like the baptistry here has some steps there. We set him down on the baptistry just so he could kind of catch his breath and that. He looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, I just feel like a, a weight has been lifted. He said, I have worried about this my entire life. What I would do. And he said, I feel so good. He said, I just feel like that weight has been lifted. You know, sin is heavy. It'll weight you down. As a matter of fact, it'll drown you in that if you're not careful. If you're a Christian and you've strayed away, you need to repent of your sins, confess those wrongs, and we'll pray with you and for you. If you're not a Christian, will you come forward while we stand and sing the song of invitation?